I'm Charles Freeman. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS, and it's my job is pretty simple. I get to uh, hand the mic over to Susan Denser and have her moderate what I think is going to be a pretty spirited debate among uh, two friends and, and colleagues and, uh, who, uh, who know a lot about the issue that we're going to talk about today. But Susan Denser um, is uh, familiar to, to many of us from her years with PBS NewsHour, uh, but is currently the editor-in-chief of, of Health Affairs, which I, I would venture to say is probably the leading uh, peer-reviewed policy journal looking at the, convert, the intersection of health policy and, and uh, health care issues generally. So fundamentally qualified to, um, to uh, guide uh, the point-counterpoint that we're, we're seeing today. It, it, before I, I close and turn it over to Susan, I just, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't say at least something about the Sendai quake and, and the fact that, that considering we're talking about health issues, there's a real humanitarian crisis that's unfolding in Sendai, and I, uh, you know, my heart goes out to them, and I hope all, all of yours does too. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Susan. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charles, and good morning to everybody. It's great to be here again at our latest installment of uh, these debates on fault lines and global health. Uh, I also want to say welcome to those of you who are joining us on the live webcast as well. For any of you who missed the uh, first three debates and desperately want to see them, they are still available on the web at smartglobalhealth.org slash fault lines. Uh, those events have really typified what we're trying to accomplish with this series, which is identify areas in which we disagree <laughs> but also move the discussion forward by identifying areas of convergence. Uh, not complete convergence, nothing is ever perfect, but we often find in the course of these uh, discussions that there are some points in which everyone can agree, uh, but we try to get there by way of having a very spirited discussion about the elements of disagreement in the first place. And so we're very fortunate that we have two uh, totally prepared to disagree people here today, Jack Chow <laughs> and Andrew Wong, uh, to answer the following question, that the United States should press China to make the full transition from health aid recipient to global health donor. So that is the resolution. Now, the way we'll proceed is that Jack is going to argue in favor of the resolution, that it is, in fact, time for the U.S. to press China to become a global health donor. Andrew will then respond. Uh, we're going to start with their opening statements, followed by questions from me, and then, of course, from all of you, and then uh, all three of us will offer our closing remarks. I'm now prompted to offer my own thoughts on this topic, but I would say they are uh, probably going to be so uh, less informed than the views of my two uh, debaters, so I'm going to yield back the balance of my time and let that, it will plunge right into the uh, discussion. Let me first, though, give you a little bit more information about our two speakers. Uh, Ambassador Jack Chow here on my right is Distinguished Service Professor of Global Health at Carnegie Mellon University, and he uh, conducts that from Carnegie Mellon's outpost here in the nation's capital. Uh, he has served pioneering roles in public service and global health diplomacy. Many of you will know he was the first Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization on HIV AIDS, TB, and Malaria. He held the rank of ambassador as the special representative of then Secretary of State Colin Powell on global HIV AIDS, and he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Health and Science, the first U.S. diplomat of ambassador rank appointed to a public health mission. Uh, he served at the State Department as a senior advisor for global health policy to the Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs. He was a management consultant at McKinsey and Company, a staff member on both the House and Senate Appropriations Committee of the U.S. Congress, and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Health at the Department of Health and Human Services. So you can see he's actually lived about 12 lives. Uh, uh, he, Jack finally is also a medical doctor, having trained at Stanford. He earned his MD at the uh, UC San Francisco School of Medicine and also has uh, a probably a, looks like about 12 additional degrees, uh, among others, from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. So we're very thrilled to have Jack with us today. Uh, Andrew also, or as he is known, but Yang Zhong is the, your formal, Andrew is my illegal. your illegal name, that's right, <laughs> right, exactly, the one you pass yourself off as here among us so folks here. Uh, Andrew is a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations and has written very extensively, uh, extensively on global health governance, governance, health diplomacy, health security, and public health in China and East Asia. He has a forthcoming book looking at health governance issues in contemporary China, including the current health care reform, 
and the government's capacity to address disease outbreaks, food and drug safety, and so forth. He's a research associate of the National Asia Research Program at the National Bureau of Asian Research and the Woodrow Wilson Center, International Center for Scholars, and also a research associate at the East Asian Institute of the National University of Singapore. He's the founding editor of Global Health Governance, the scholarly journal for the new health security paradigm. He's also on the editorial board of several journals and is an associate professor and director for global health studies at the John C. Whitehead School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. Uh, he's taught at a, a number of places, including Barnard and Columbia, and received his PhD from the University of Chicago. So you can see they come formidably equipped to uh, discuss this particular issue. So, Jack, we're going to turn to you first to argue in favor again of this resolution that the U.S. should press China to make that full transition from health aid recipient to global health donor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Susan, and thank you to CSIS, uh, Steve Morrison, Charles Freeman, Lisa Cardi, Seth Gannon. Thank you, uh, the community of CSIS, for coming and hearing the argument. And uh, I also want to convey on behalf of us our heartfelt compassion for the people in Japan. Uh, our, we hope our, our friends, professional and personal, are, are doing okay. Uh, I should st state that the views expressed are my own and not necessarily those of the organizations with whom I'm affiliated with. Um, I've had, uh, I've been invited to uh, take on the challenge of affirming uh, this resolution. And in the 10 minutes that's allotted to me, I thought I would, the, the argument really cleaves into two components, uh, the disparity of need and the disparity of uh, the supply of aid. Uh, the, the global health movement is really a special mission, and that special mission is what can we do as a global community, a world community, to confront uh, the uh, dynamic of disease, death, and debilitation as they intersect with the forces of poverty in impoverished regions of the world. And the center of gravity of this campaign uh, is Sub-Saharan Africa. The World Bank has estimated that nearly half of the people in, in that region uh, live or subsist, or I would even say endure, uh, at uh, an income level of $1.25 a day, basically 500 dollars a year. Forty percent of the children in the region are, are undernourished, are, are underweight and under height for their age compared to uh, the demographic standard. And the, the pandemics, I was tasked to confront AIDS, TB, and malaria. When you add up the mortality statistics, three million on AIDS, two million on TB, one million on Six million deaths every year just from these three diseases uh, on top of the devastation that is going on with maternal child health, other neglected and tropical uh, diseases. So it, it is not a, just a turn of phrase that these are the diseases of mass destruction. These are the diseases of societal destruction. In spite of that, or, or, or it, to enter the breach 10 years ago, this country uh, in an alliance with others uh, in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks uh, embarked on signature moves in global health, adding chapters to the saga. The PEPFAR initiative, Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, that's now operating intensively in 15 countries. The launch of uh, the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria that has now garnered 20 plus billion dollars in, in pledges. The Presidential Malaria Initiative, also working in a uh, stepwise, uh, accelerated fashion, providing bed nets and ACTs uh, in Africa. And as that trajectory was launched, as everybody knows, uh, beginning in about 2008, <coughs> the world has endured a uh, debilitating, crippling uh, worldwide economic recession. And that recession has produced uh, profound suffering here in the United States, 10% unemployment, 
uh, probably the next 10% are worried about their jobs, and the rest of the citizens three are, 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 are highly anxious about the economic situation. Uh, last year, the Europe, uh, the Eurozone underwent its currency crisis. So altogether, the United States uh, in fighting the recession has accumulated a debt uh, of 14 trillion dollars. And from that deficit, there is high anxiety about the implementation of the American health care reform movement. Uh, watch TV, their states are struggling to cope with their deficits. Even amid this economic stress, the global health movement has continued. Secretary Clinton has uh, uh, launched the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review, Quitter for the Washingtonians among us, that advances the notion of developmental diplomacy. How do we assert peaceful civilian power throughout the regions of strategic interest to the United States? And in spite of the recession, the Global Fund was able to raise 12, nearly $12 billion in pledges. Uh, the 0 0.7 alliance of smaller countries, uh, countries uh, such as Sweden and Denmark, who are allocating 0.7% of their GDP to overseas uh, development assistance. Last December, Japan launched its $3 billion global health initiative. And today, I would argue that their ability to implement is understandably in question. Russia repaid the global fund, the grants that it had received uh, up into the recession, and the uh, Toronto G20 assembly uh, declared that maternal and child health as part of the Millennium Development Goals is worthy of a, another seven billion dollars in pledges. So amid the crisis of 9-11, amid the economic stresses, the global health agenda moves forward. But where is the disparity in supply? <clears throat> the People's Republic of China, in the past five years through this recession, has been able, admirably, to grow their economy by an estimate of 11.2% cumulative annual uh, growth rate over the past five years. They have uh, uh, been able to earn an accelerating budget surplus that's unprecedented in history and has uh, amassed a nearly $3 trillion uh, foreign currency reserve. And from that foreign currency reserve, they've allocated $200 billion for investment. But even with that, they've been China has uh, uh, secured a billion dollars from the Global Fund, uh, $150 million to fight malaria in a region where WHO says it's a, a fairly low prevalence state. Uh, they recently, yesterday, earned a $150 million World Bank loan for water treatment. Uh, they have uh, increased their position at the IMF. They have uh, yet to declare a global health and development strategy. Uh, and we've been monitoring the annual legislative session and uh, th there is no sense of movement from, from them. So the differentiation of uh, the capital wealth position of the United States and China is $17 trillion. And that dynamic has consequences. It, has, it means that when the global fund uh, on its recent fundraising campaign, this came about $300 million short. China could have made a difference. People are concerned about the ability of the world to accomplish the Millennium Development Goals along a number of fronts. The, uh, <clears throat> already in the United States, there are calls from uh, different quarters of Congress uh, asking the administration press China to do more. <clears throat> so constructively, what can the U.S. Uh, do to uh, persuade and engage China? I refer to Jim Steinberg, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, 
I had the fortune to pose a question at the Center for the National Interest, and I'm going to cover it for Jim. It's not an articulation of official policy, but I asked him, I said, what can China do to advance humanitarian policy? And he said, well, China has, basically, I'm paraphrasing, an obligation as a global citizen that they have a stake in the solution, and that on issues such as AIDS, TB, and malaria, that they ought to play a stronger role. I think, I believe, that a framework of engagement can include the following elements, that the developmental diplomacy under Quitter ought to be multilateral and actively pursued to bring in surplus donors like China and the oil-producing nations, that the U.S.-China strategic and economic dialogue be a platform for engagement with China between OGAC, USAID, and the Global Health Coordinator with their counterparts, that there be a trilateral approach, that the U.S.-China works together in regions like Africa, that there be a package of technical assistance from the U.S. to China on biomedical research, on epidemiology, and science policy, that Ambassador nominee Secretary Locke, if confirmed, can bring this agenda directly in Beijing, and that what we're seeking is an outcome that China refrains from taking more global help, the Global Fund grant, allowing those resources to flow to the neediest countries, that China seeks a target, an ODA target of maybe 0.5% of GDP over the next 10 to 20 years, that it repurposes some of that money. It had a stimulus package of $586 billion, of which $27 billion was dedicated to the health system upgrades. That if it was rounded up to $30 billion, I think we wouldn't be having this conversation today. That China formulates and declares a strategic goal, and a strategic goal has three essential elements, a finish line, a verifiable finish line, a timeline, and a headline. What is the declarative value of their action? And that it works in compact with the global community in implementing emergency assistance in regions such as Africa and Haiti. And then finally, that it ups its contribution to the multilateral constellation of agencies such as WHO, UNICEF, UNDP. So with that, I believe my 10 minutes is up, and I welcome any queries at this stage. Terrific. And at this point, precisely, we do that. Andrew, we give you the opportunity to ask questions of Jack. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jack. And before I ask questions of Jack, I'd like to thank CSIS for inviting me over, and thank Steve and Charles and Seth for making that very considerate arrangement. It's really an honor to be here. But before I get started, I have to admit that I'm not good at debating polemic topics. The last time I had a formal debate was 23 years ago. You clearly don't have children. I do. When I was a sophomore student, we were debating whether China should have a shock therapy or not for the economy. And I lost it to a freshman. And I have never been a diplomat, so forgive me if sometimes I'm not that diplomatic. But I think this is a very good intellectual exercise. I'm asked by Seth to be in that position, but don't mistake me. I'm not either. I'm not a panda hugger. I'm neither a dragon slayer. Well, I do, after hearing Jack talking about the need for U.S. to press China to make the transition from health aid recipient to global health donor, I do have a question. What do you mean by full transition? And how do you characterize China's status 
would you think that ch view China as an aggressive um, aid, help aid seeker or a passive uh, um, the um, in, uh, in involved in um, global health um, uh, or a passive global health donor? How would you characterize China's status? It's an excellent uh, question, Yan Zhong. I, I, I would uh, uh, have a uh, series of milestones that would uh, define that transition. I uh, enumerated some of them, which is to um, stop taking global fund grants, uh, to start donating uh, to the global fund. Right now, their, their donation rate is uh, $14 million over five years. Certainly, that could be up. I, 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 I would have a suggestive goal uh, over the next five years of having China donate $100 million a year. Uh, all they have to, well, with the, from the interest of the CIDIC of $300 million, they could easily, easily cover this. And that uh, I would note that Jim Wolfenson, the past president of the World Bank, is on the CIC International Advisory Board. So I, I would see that as a positive, positive sign. <clears throat> other, other milestones is that we'd like to see China perhaps develop a Chinese version of USAID, uh, CHAID, right? a Chinese uh, agency for international development staffed with uh, professionals that would organize and coordinate and be the nexus for interactions with our USAID and BIFID. In terms of country operations, China could certainly um, contribute uh, technical experts, uh, primary care physicians, and nurses that work in concert with uh, PEPFAR and, and other uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, organizations. Uh, <clears throat> so those are some of the uh, tangible operational uh, objectives that I could see that could be embarked upon. Again, I am not here to indict China and say, uh, there, I, I'm, I'm here to catalyze that dialogue and give encouragement to China because we need China to be part of the global health story. Uh, Andrew, do you have another question? I'm not sure. Uh, it may have been that Jack, did, w w did he answer the question you asked? Because it seemed to me you were asking something different, which is how would you characterize this unusual situation China is in at the moment of being on the one hand, a, and as we know, heavily, heavily investing in African countries in many other respects, building roads, uh, et cetera, uh, building hospitals in some cases. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a donor and a taker at the same time. Was that the right, direction you were going in? Yeah. But Jack did answer my question, okay. what exactly that what transition means. You know. But I'm still curious whether Jack would agree that China is, he seems to imply that China is a very aggressive uh, health aid seeker. Is that the? Uh, My interpretation, <laughs> having worked at WHO and working with health ministries, health ministries are typically underdogs in their budget, budget battles. My role is to bolster them, help health ministries produce the outcomes that allow them to, to win the budget battles in their home governments. I believe, and I have no direct evidence, but just from my WHO tenure, that China's Ministry of Health is in a similar situation, that the, uh, the hard power agencies are getting the lion's share of budgetary resources, so that the ministry has to go out and uh, get business on their own, get the, win the grants on their own. And I, I, I think that's a question best placed to the ministry themselves. And I have, I've enjoyed the quarrel, my quarrel is not with, with the health professionals of, of China, and I've worked with them uh, throughout. But I think this dynamic is what is causing them to uh, seek to pull money from the international system. So it sounds like, if anything, you would characterize them as a reluctant aid seeker forced into that of necessity because it is a soft power agency, the Ministry of Health. Is that fair? OK. All right, well, we are going to move on now to uh, Andrew's opening statement, and he has 10 minutes to set forth uh, 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 his feelings and pronouncements on the other side. So, Andrew, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, actually, well, 
<laughs> as I told you, uh, Seth, when, before we had this debate, uh, Jack and I, we had, had a lot, uh, we agree, uh, many fronts. You know, so that is what make this debate uh, okay, sort of don't difficult. Don't get there yet. All right. <laughs> but we do agree that, uh, um, I agree with Jack, that China should chip in more in global health as it becomes richer, because that is good uh, for global health governance. That is good for China's own international image. We also agree that uh, um, China should be encouraged uh, to uh, play a more prominent role in global health, and the United States could play a constructive role by, in working closely with China uh, toward this direction by, through uh, channels such as strategic and economic dialogue. Uh, but that being said, I do have some issues with uh, uh, the, the Jack's arguments. Um, First of all, let's get the facts right. Foreign exchange reserve, well, we know China has 2.5 trillion foreign exchange reserve, but foreign exchange reserve is not a good way of judging a country's development level. Okay? If you look at the 20 countries uh, with the largest foreign exchange reserve, six, including China, India, Indonesia, Algeria, Thailand, Brazil, continue to be uh, recipients of uh, global fund money. A more useful predictor is the GDP per capita. Right? If we actually, if we plot the per capita GDP against the share of ODA, official development assistance, in GNI, gross national income, there is actually a very strong correlation between the two. That is, the higher the per capita GDP, the more generous a country will uh, become in providing development aid. So it is not a surprise that Norway, Luxembourg, in Sweden, but well, they spend a larger share of their, GD, uh, their gross national income on official development assistance. Okay. This, let's look at the China. Right? In terms of per capita GDP, China continues to have a very low GDP per capita. Right? The, uh, the more recent data suggested that its GDP per capita is about $3,400. Uh, that is significantly lower than the world average. Is nine thousand U.S. dollars, and even lower than South Africa right? um, and Botswana, right? and also what Jack mentioned, there are people who uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa who um, are, are below the poverty line. But keep in mind, China has between one hundred thirty to one hundred sixty million people still living below the World Bank designated the poverty line, right? and also if you compare. Look at some of the Chinese provinces. Right? Each province, in terms of its land mass and its population uh, level, it's like a middle-sized country, right? So I found it, instead of comparing China directly with other less developed countries, why not compare these Chinese provinces, especially poor provinces, with those countries in sub-Saharan Africa, right? I have the data here. Right? Some of the Chinese very poor provinces, including Guizhou, Gansu, um, uh, Yunnan, and Tibet. Right? They um, uh, just give you an example. Guizhou, it has a GDP per capita of $1,500. It's a population of 38 million people. Right? It is poorer than Sudan right? or Guyana. And if those countries like Sudan, South Africa, Guyana could be legitimate recipients of health aid, why not these poor Chinese provinces? Right? And um, if you look at also the Chinese health disease burden, right? uh, despite those um, progress China has made uh, over the past decades, China continued to face a huge, actual growing uh, disease burden. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, the, um, the chronic non-communicable disease, just to focus on the infectious disease, HIV. China has 740,000 HIV carriers. Um, uh, the serum prevalence level is not that high, 0.06%, but 56.8% uh, of people who are infected do not know their status. So that uh, means but that the HIV is spreading quickly from high-risk groups to the general population. Let's look at TB. 
Jack just mentioned that in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are two million people suffering uh, the tuberculosis. But in China, it, is the second, it has the second largest TB population in the world, right? trailing India. Right? Uh, it has 1.3 million new cases of TB each year. What about HBV, a hepatitis B virus? China has 130 million people um, carrying the HBV virus. That amounts one-third of the world total. Okay. And uh, the, uh, well, these disease challenges pose a big challenge uh, to China's health system. Right? Uh, if, uh, actually, based on the two-week morbidity rate uh, in 1998, uh, one study uh, uh, predicted that between 2000 and uh, 2025, uh, the uh, number of uh, pa- uh, the, the, the uh, patients are going to increase by 70%. Uh, the annual outpatient visits or the people who are hospitalized are going to increase by at least 40%. And the medical spending is going to increase by at least 50%. So that is a huge challenge to China's health system right? capacity. Let's look at the health system capacity. Does it have that capacity to... Um, with uh, that challenges. Unfortunately, despite the fact that China is getting richer and the central state coffer is expanding uh, dramatically, right, there is a central local gap in financing health care. Right? Uh, uh, if you look at the local level uh, health financing, uh, the 1994 uh, the tax um, reform actually uh, makes things even worse because it re-centralized the fiscal power, but f- decentralized the fiscal responsibilities. So the central government scooped most of the lucrative taxes, and leaving the local governments with very low revenue bearing taxes that were costly to collect. Right? And that problem was even more precarious at the sub-provincial level. Uh, so decentralization has not led, not led to a U.S. style federalism, well, local governments right, focus on police power. It actually has increased the burden of local governments by shouldering them the responsibilities of promoting local econo- economic growth and uh, public goods provision, including health care uh, provision. Right? And with GDP still the yardstick to measure their performance, the local government officials, this cash-strapped local governments have few incentives to adequately finance health care and to reflect that marginalized status of health care in their agenda. Um, the um, government health spending as a percentage of total health expenditure actually dropped from 36% in 1980 to 25% in 2008. Right? So you see that while China is getting wealthier, so richer, that has not been translated into similar health system capacity at the local level. Right? And this happened at a time when this growing disease burden reduced the state capacity when ever-increasing capacity is needed to tackle the challenges. Right? So um, the, if those purely endogenous solutions to build capacity is unlikely going to be successful, that capacity has to be imported from exogenous uh, uh, sources like massive foreign aid. Right? And poorly, uh, the, uh, uh, the having a full tra- transition uh, to the donor status is not going to lead to increased health spending at the local level. Actually, it's going to do more harm than good if we consider all these pon- positive benefits. The, um, massive foreign aid, especially uh, health aid, has down uh, to uh, the Chinese health system capacity. So my argument is different from Jack's. That is, uh, we don't, uh, I think it's not a good idea to uh, seek a full transition uh, uh, to uh, a global health donor status at this moment. All right, now we turn uh, to a similar opportunity that we now give Jack to ask questions of Andrew based on what he has just said. Thank you. Thank you for your very thoughtful exposition. Um, (coughs) You mentioned the GDP numbers being fairly humble. And I think China, 
lives under the tyranny of the large number, that any asset divided by 1.3 billion people yeah. will yield a low number. So by that line of thought, for China to reach a metric in which it could enter the uh, pathway of being a donor, uh, the, the GDP would have to be in multiple trillions of dollars if it was to be divided by 1.3 or 1.5 mm -hmm. billion. So it's, uh, uh, again, we're debating statistics, but let me focus, uh, uh, I'd like to get your Reaction to that. Oh, you want? <laughs> well, I agree that uh, this, because this is just a too big a country. Well, the Wen Jiabo actually mentioned in Harvard that the, you know a big problem is divided by 1.3 billion. It's a small problem. Right? <laughs> if it's multiplied by 1.3 billion, a small problem can become a huge, humongous problem. Uh, the uh, but uh, I, I agree that uh, well, the, 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 this the, uh, that is the issue. But I'm not, this is not my attention, intention to say that China has to reach this, uh, as, to be as rich as the United States to be a global health donor. Actually, if you look at the trajectory of those global health donors like Japan and other countries, you don't have to be as rich as the United States or other developed countries to be a matured global health donor. And I uh, uh, have some data, like Japan, for example, they joined the Club of Donors in 1954 when its GDP per capita was uh, just 30% of the U.S. level. Right? Uh, Russia, uh, that uh, you just mentioned, that the, uh, seems to be very um, 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 the, uh, uh, aggressive in becoming a global health donor, but it is a country with GDP per capita that is more than twice higher than China, and it is categorized as an up-middle-income uh, country, by the way. And China's GDP level today is only 10% of the U.S. level. So uh, the, uh, in my um, point here is that we should give it more time. We should be more patient. It doesn't have to reach the U.S. level of uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the GDP per capita in order to be a full global health donor. But uh, at least uh, we should give them more time. And Yan Zhong, if, if, if the trade, if, if the foreign exchange currency reserve is not an issue, or it's a, it's a minor force in, 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 in your, your outline, then what, at what level do you think would trigger them to be a donor? If, if you're saying don't be a donor at $3 trillion, mm -hmm. what level do you think they could do it? At $10 trillion? I think there's a political dynamic here of the optics that you know, they've built basically a Mount Everest mountainside cash reserve, in fact, they own the capital um, mm -hmm. that is heavily invested in U.S. treasuries. So you have this dynamic, and this is an American-centric proposition, mm -hmm. of Americans who lost their jobs because of this bilateral trade relationship. They're paying the interest on the debt that we owe to uh, the, the, the holders of the, the, and we're exporting money to support their health system. So Where's the equity in this? Well, Jack, it seems to imply China is a passive uh, global health donor here. That, uh, and actually, um, just to, um, if we look at the history, well, China has been actually a very aggressive donor nation until, had been a very aggressive donor nation until the 1980s, believe it or not. Uh, for a long time, China was very generous provider of development assistance to the third world, of course, for political reasons. And actually, even during 1958 and 1961, when 30 million Chinese lives were lost in the famine, uh, China was still sending, that was a ridiculous thing, was still sending money and food to other countries, including Albania. Uh, the uh, foreign aid to the third world increased in the 1960s and through the 19. 70s, you know, when China felt impelled to support the decolonization movement and called the support of the third world countries. So uh, Chinese development assistance as a percentage of fiscal spending actually increased to 7.2% in 1973. That was higher than most developed countries at that time. Uh, and it was only uh, in the 1970s, in a way, there was the agenda shift, and then uh, they uh, reassessed the uh, China's uh, foreign aid program 
they draw some very important lessons for uh, the China's uh, the foreign aid experience. You know, uh, basically, they learn from that experience that the, uh, the amount of foreign aid should match the uh, uh, the uh, domestic development level. Uh, that uh, uh, the um, uh, there are limits of using foreign aid as a foreign policy instrument. You cannot use foreign aid to pie friendship of those countries. We all know that Vietnam, uh, Albania later become sort of like, you know, especially Vietnam, enemies of China, even though they pumped you know, a tremendous amount of foreign aid. They also learned that the foreign aid, if it's pursued, should be mutually beneficial process. So eventually, with this growing burden of... Uh, um, in providing foreign aid and the West and abuse of the aid you know, by the recipient countries, you know, China reduced or readjusted the foreign aid policy in the 1970s. That led to a significant drop of foreign aid as a percentage of the fiscal spending. You know. So I believe there's a reason for China you know, to be hesitant uh, in uh, being a full what Jack defined for global health donor because that uh, aid philosophy, uh, that policy adjustment that was the, the, that did the 1970s still pretty much affect the thinking of the Chinese policy makers. Great. Well, we've heard now these two uh, arguments laid out. Uh, Jack's essentially being, look, judged by a number of metrics, China's a rich country. Uh, it is still receiving money, obviously, from the Global Fund uh, for certain areas, but th it really makes no sense judged against China's enormous increased wealth in recent years. And uh, China really needs to step up to the plate and play a stronger role. And he laid out a series of metrics for that, uh, things that China could begin to do, whether it was raising contributions to UNICEF, developing a Chinese equivalent of USAID, course, stop taking the Global Fund grants and start becoming a Global Fund uh, donor. Uh, then we heard uh, Andrew's counter set of counter arguments, essentially that the some of these metrics about foreign exchange reserves, et cetera, are misleading, that a better measurement is GDP per capita. And he acknowledged that because of uh, the one three billion point three billion denominator, that it tends to uh, lower the uh, per capita amount, but nonetheless, China is overall still a poorer country, uh, particularly when you look at the situation of the poorer provinces and the populations in those poorer provinces. He mentioned the growing disease burden that China faces itself in HIV, AIDS, TB. Uh, and he didn't mention the non-communicable disease burden, but that is also quite enormous. And so, Given all of this, and given that China is still working through the internal wrangling over how revenue is going to be collected centrally and dispersed among these poor provinces in particular, it's not a good idea to lean on China too hard at this time. So that's essentially his argument. So let me go back to you, Jack, and ask you. So you heard Andrew's perspective, really, and uh, I will add to that that we know that there are 300 million Chinese without health insurance. So China has the uninsured equivalent of the entire U.S. population, in effect, without health insurance. Uh, the country is undertaking very aggressive health reforms to try to cover more people itself and radically raise the level of services provided, especially in the poor provinces. Uh, so the argument essentially, as, as Andrew said, is they've got a lot of their own knitting to attend to, and maybe for the stability of the world, not to mention the well-being of the Chinese people, it's better to let uh, give them some, cut them some slack for the moment and let them expend more resources on their own population, as opposed to requiring them to become a large global donor at this point. So what, how would you respond to that? There's, there's not enough PEPFAR was launched as an emergency plan to rescue as many men, women, and children who lack ARVs, who lack tuberculosis drugs, who don't have access to bed nets. So for the argument to say, oh, we can afford to wait, means, uh, means a, a, a tragic outcome for, for many of these countries. Um, you 
talked about the knitting, it seems that there's a country that can buy a lot of yarn. Um, there's a, been identified provinces in China and large swaths of population who are uninsured. And the, the, uh, the English translation of the stimulus package, that $586 billion, uh, indicated that China was about to uh, spend $125 billion to cover 90% uh, of the population in rural regions. We hope that they implement that. Um, there's obviously some budget disconnect in the China political ecology that, that they took $200 billion from their foreign exchange surplus and put it into the China Investment Corporation. And in three years, they grew that $200 billion to $380 billion investing in American and European companies. That $386 billion is now about five times the size of the Gates Foundation. The interest on that $380 billion or the earnings could have easily been dedicated to social investing, investing in China or to supplement the budget of these provinces. So now you have the dynamic, the pathway, in which China is now the fourth largest recipient of global fund grants. It has a large, it has earned more money from the global fund than South Africa. Th this, if President Bush were to learn, if, at, at the genesis of, of uh, de donating funds to the global fund, and he said, Mr. President, we're going to create a global fund to confront disease in Africa. Oh, and fast forward 10 years later, the fourth largest recipient will be a country with $3 trillion in exchange reserves, I would, it's speculation, I would predict that initiative would have been truncated. So at the time of PEPFAR and the Global Fund, the world was very different. The, the economics, the relative status of these countries were different. So in the past five years, that has been radically, radically transformed. So there's, there's an opportunity, we've laid out the gaps, and I'm saying, China has the wherewithal, the resources, it takes the willpower and the friendly nudging of the United States, this administration, the, the, the people of the United States, the Congress, to say, hey, look, we need you as part of the alliance. We need you as to be part of the coalition of the caring and concerned. And this trajectory only makes the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa worse. Okay, well, thank you. Well. Uh, Andrew, to turn over to you, in a way, Jack is being very diplomatic and, and uh, yeah. polite, but if I could uh, take the journalistic approach <laughs> <laughs> and sort of distill down what he's saying, he's more or less saying, look, Andrew, just because China runs a completely screwed up fiscal policy mm -hmm. and a completely right manipulative <laughs> currency policy, and has accumulated these huge reserves and, as, as he says, using them to invest uh, in, in international companies and, and neglecting, in effect, the poor provinces uh, who, and, and reducing a large portion of the Chinese population to much more, uh, uh, much l a much lower standard of living than is the case in the coastal regions. Uh, just because China elects to do all of that doesn't mean we should excuse them from uh, the uh, investing and assisting in other areas of the world where the emergencies are quite dire, specifically sub-Saharan Africa. So that it is, it is not a reasonable excuse to say, uh, uh, good, China, take 10 or 15 years to sort yourselves out, uh, bring up the standard of living of your own people, and then we'll let you off, we'll, we will not only uh, uh, stop giving you money from the Global Fund, uh, uh, we, and we will expect you to be a net contributor to the Global Fund as well as to other uh, international assistance efforts. So how do you respond to that? Okay, well, Jack okay. is, of course, very, always very diplomatic. Thank you for also <laughs> presenting your journalist for a second. I'm going to present my scholarly perspective. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, yeah, I, I think well, this might be blunt. I think China should not be blamed uh, for other countries' predicament. Uh, the, um, China, for example, they apply for and, and being awarded uh, the global 
fund money, right, they went through the same review approval process, right, that the same uh, uh, standards apply, and uh, they implement those programs, we, uh, those grants with A ratings, so they are eleg uh, the eligible for continuous funding, and we can't blame them you know, for that, and you, if do that, that we're going to publish, uh, punish the, the, the winners. Right? Uh, the also, did China move the uh, other countries' cheese? Uh, if you look at the OECD data, right, 113 countries received the global fund money, including 33 countries whose GDP per capita is higher uh, than China's. Uh, the, um, and China receives a total G, uh, global fund money of um, 10, uh, 1 billion, uh, if we count the 2010 data, of course. Well, that is higher than four, country, four countries. Uh, but uh, if you divide, again, this is the tyranny of large numbers, <laughs> uh, if you divide it by 1.3 billion, that's only 32 cents uh, for China. That is uh, um, significantly lower than most recipient countries, including South Africa, which got uh, 3.74 in terms of the uh, global, house, uh, global fund money per capita, Car Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Nigeria. It's even lower than India's. Right? Uh, so uh, the, uh, China is not an aggressive um, seeker of the, um, of the uh, health aid, and it won't be very fair to blame China for problems of other countries. And I think there's a solution. The solution is not to press China to significantly increase its global uh, uh, the, uh, health aid, but to ask those OECD countries, including the United States, to uh, fulfill its political pledge of increase its uh, of the development assistance aid to 0.7% uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the level that they pledged, that is the, uh, the development aid as, as the uh, percentage of the uh, gross national income. Right? Uh, Jack, you mentioned the QDDR, right? The, the purpose of the QDDR is to call for leading through civilian power you know, to address uh, the, uh, the global problems. Right? It presents explicit, in my opinion, explicit serious approach to project the, and improve the U.S. soft power. Right? And if we are even debating here, I, unfortunately, this is happening in the Congress, whether to cut foreign aid. I think this is sending a bad message to the th uh, developing countries. It also makes our policy look less coherent. Okay. We're going to open this up now to questions uh, from all of you in the audience. While we're waiting for someone to ask a question, and, and let me also add, if you would, identify yourself by name and affiliation before you ask a question. That would be very helpful. But let me just give Jack a brief opportunity to respond to what Andrew just said, particularly on this point about uh, confusion of objectives on our part in the United States uh, on what, uh, what uh, we really want China to do. Well, we, there, there, there is a critique of the, the Global Plus policy eligibility criteria. That uh, would probably take a, another debate. Uh, I believe that the, the administration can do more to tighten and clarify uh, the, the eligibility criteria at the Global Fund. I have yet to see that uh, happen in a real tangible way. I, I hope that the diplomatic team will start to take to heart uh, this dynamic where it's not only China, but others that are Subtract from that could be that that could have been dedicated to the most in, impoverished regions. Uh, uh, again, I, I focus on the China's uh, budget ecology, if you will. That you've laid out the gaps. Uh, why can't the budget system? And China's now going through its annual legislative session. Why can't they are, are able? to uh, invest 
domestically to the extent that it doesn't have to draw upon the global fund. I mean, that's the, that seems to me, where's the disconnect? Where is the policy architect who can say, I believe these provinces deserve more funding. Let's mobilize, whether it's from the CIC or the internal regular budget process, uh, sufficient discretionary funds to these regions, thereby relieving and, and allowing China to, to do more on the international stage. With your response. <coughs> so I agree with Jack that there should, uh, the, uh, the, in terms of the, uh, the fiscal spending, the structural, uh, the uh, public finance in particular, they should uh, restructure the central local relationship. Uh, if you want to shoulder the uh, local governments with, more res with all the responsibilities, you have to give them the full fi adequate financing to get the job done. Unfortunately, that is not happening today. And in fact, China, well, that's the, uh, the hurdles you know, that preventing China from chipping more the global health, that uh, so far it still attaches more importance to domestic issues, you know, according to the senior, uh, senior uh, Chinese health official last year. Uh, I, I quote him, China is still a developing nation, and its social economic development is still facing grim challenges. So China would make, uh, itself would make significant contribution to global health if it could address the major public health problems of the 1.3 billion people of their own. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, what is happening in the Middle East actually uh, would um, make, I believe, even more difficult for the uh, government to change that mentality because it highlights the importance of tackling domestic uh, issues. Uh, we know that there was a study, uh, the uh, Chris was there. We, uh, last time we mentioned that study by Ted Gurr, Robert Bates, and others, you know, basically found a strong correlation between infant mortality rate and political instability, including uh, disruptive regime transitions. And actually, China has an infant mortality of 18. That is very close to Egypt, Tunisia, and higher than Libya. So if the central leaders were really uh, that, uh, this, the, uh, I hope they, they got that message. Well, I hope they didn't, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they would uh, think, hmm, I better have to invest more in my domestic uh, uh, the health system. Otherwise, I would be in big trouble. And, uh, OK. So are there questions for these folks? And please identify yourself again by name. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Isaac. I'm working with uh, Friends of the Global Fight here in Washington. And uh, I just wanted to uh, direct a question to um, Ambassador Chow uh, as to whether some of the things that he's been suggesting should happen may actually already be in process. And by that, I mean, uh, for example, that in round 10, uh, you know, which the Global Fund was, uh, was making its latest round of grants, uh, only 15.7 million was devoted to China, I believe. Uh, for a grant that actually will take place uh, entirely in Burma, I think, across the border in a section of Burma. Um, and uh, as well, uh, as I think you alluded to a moment ago, the Global Fund Board of Directors is working on eligibility changes that are intended to direct more of the funding away from middle-income nations, such as China, perhaps to, to focus more on the poor nations. And the Global Fund spent, uh, you know, as I understand it, tremendous amount of time and effort to try to convince China to up its donation. So this is along the lines, I think, of what you were addressing a moment ago. But what, what, what needs to happen politically right now in addition to what's already occurring to make these things that you're talking about come about? Good to see you, Mark. And uh, thank you for, your, uh, for the update. And I think these uh, steps are, are very helpful. Uh, I'm not saying that, that they're not. In terms of uh, uh, some tangible action at, at, at the Global Fund, uh, they would escalate their, their pledge. And structurally, we, I would like to see China uh, change its uh, uh, board seat category from an implementing country to a donor country. That would be a very positive signal to the world community that it, it is, it is uh, taking to heart uh, the, the forces that I uh, just described. And it would actually change, for those of us who have been involved in the Global Fund, would positively affect dynamics. China as a donor board seat uh, would uh, uh, be contributing uh, to thinking through uh, the operating architecture of, uh, of the fund. 
Now that seems like a fairly modest proposal, Andrew. Would you go along with that, that at least symbolically China should declare itself a donor, um, maybe beyond symbolically, stop taking the money of, of, a, of, a, of a recipient country, an implementing country, and become a donor? It is a donor, actually. It is actually well, the situation for China is both a recipient of, of uh, health aid and a donor of the, uh, uh, the, the, the global health, uh, the, uh, the foreign aid, related foreign aid. If, uh, uh, like when Jiabao, the Chinese premier, announced uh, um, the closing of the summit, uh, the uh, UN summit on China's commitment to contribute the U.S. dollars, uh, $14 million, to the global fund within the next three uh, years. But, uh, that was actually almost the total amount China pledged to the global fund money over the past seven years. And that actually makes a China top donor among all the developing countries in contributing to global fund. Because if you look at India, I, I just uh, I was perusing all those the um, the uh, global fund uh, third voluntary replenish replenishment uh, the pledges for 2011 2013. Right, India and Brazil did not contribute a dime. Right? South Africa contributed 2.1 million dollars. And when Jabo is more, even more interesting than when Jabo announced plans to build 200 schools, dispatch 3,000 uh, medical experts, and train 5,000 local medical personnel, and provide medical equipment and medicines to 100 hospitals. Uh, and all this, I think, uh, is a good sign and uh, suggests that China, well, that process has already started for China to become eventually a fourth donor. that uh, there would be a policy of a uh, country such as China being a net beneficiary, uh, that if you uh, divide the $1 billion that they've already gotten by the run rate of $14 million or whatever, $3 million a year, there's actually no intention for China to ever become a net beneficiary at this rate. A, a net beneficiary or a net donor? Uh, net, 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 no. Allow countries such as China to be remain a net beneficiary. Right. So they've gotten a billion; they're paying in three million a year. So you do the math. Right. Uh, unless that 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 trajectory changes at that run rate, they will not become a net net donor. Donor. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I w <laughs> actually, uh, Jack, I would agree, uh, disagree with that. I believe once China uh, sort of uh, had fixed its own uh, domestic health, health system. And uh, once that uh, the mentality, the philosophy has changed, we would expect a significant uh, contribution uh, for China uh, to, to contribute to uh, global health. In fact, uh, uh, is Catherine here today? No. The, uh, the uh, CSIS has released, oh, yeah, they released a report a couple of months ago that uh, um, uh, it's entitled the key uh, players uh, in global health, right? Right, yes. Actually, one of the uh, crucial message, actually, I found it very interesting is that uh, this give uh, the, uh, uh, the um, government's motivations for becoming involved in global health policy debates and cooperation programs vary and depend to a large extent on domestic health and political conditions. So uh, my, I'm still uh, I'm optimistic that uh, um, in the uh, not long uh, uh, future that uh, China could uh, um, uh, become a significant uh, donor uh, nation uh, in terms of global health. Let's, let's move off of the subject of the Global Fund for just a moment. I'll come to this question in a moment. I just want to quickly ask some of the other gestures that Jack indicated China could take that would be important symbolically and, and, uh, and substantively, uh, developing a Chinese equivalent of USAID, uh, upping mm -hmm. its contributions to UNICEF and other, other uh, 
assistance organizations. What, what, what would be wrong with that, particularly, again, given however we want to characterize China, it's hard to characterize it as a poor country anymore, notwithstanding the fact that it's a developing country with a lot of poor people and an emerging power mm -hmm. with a lot of poor people in it. Well, I think this is a good yeah. advice. In fact, I was, the, uh, Jack, you knew that, the actual su suggesting to the Chinese government that you should probably have the U.S. equivalent to uh, the USAID uh, to um, to be in charge of those the uh, the foreign uh, aid and development assistance and uh, currently that is the uh, it's a very fragmented structural uh, that that's authority uh, all the uh, responsibilities uh, uh, scattered um, on different uh, bureaucracies including Ministry of Health the Ministry. Of uh, the uh, the commerce and uh, the, uh, the the very powerful the uh, National Committee on Development and Reform in DRC, uh, the uh, what actually there are also there are many Chinese researchers uh, uh, scholars uh, are campaigning for that. But the problem here is still I think one of that is the political uh, the, uh, the China. I believe it is un it would be unrealistic. Uh, to expect Beijing to significantly uh, increase its financial contribution to global health when Beijing still view the demands for China to shoot a more global responsibility sort of as a conspiracy uh, to slow down China's growth, you know, to contain China's rise. You know, that was actually uh, the, one of the political hurdles we face, you know, changing. Uh, that uh, the, the structural and I. But 0.5 um, percent of GDP is hardly going to slow down China's rise substantially, mm -hmm. right? And that's what, that was the threshold that Jack was suggesting uh, be aimed at. Now, I'm not uh, disagreeing with Jack about the, the actual numbers. It's here I'm talking about the political holders. If the mentality is still there, if those the, the policy makers, decision makers, you know, they are convinced, and all those pressures, those talks about China shouldering more responsibilities, are just a conspiracy, right? Or in their words, uh, they uh, these they are, you know requires to ask China to take a gl more global responsibilities, and obligations do not match China's power status. They only exaggerated China's power and the influence while well, in an attempt to shirk the Western so-called developed countries' responsibilities, while at the same time trying, in their words, sowing the uh, discord between China and a large number of uh, developing countries. Okay. That <laughs> makes it difficult. Let's go mm -hmm. to this question here, and then we'll come over here. Hi, I'm, she I'm Shelley Bressler. I'm with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on the Republican staff, and I do global health. And one of the issues that um, hits me when I go to these African countries is they show off the brand new Chinese soccer stadium, or they mm -hmm. show off the brand new Chinese performance, performing arts um, center for a country that doesn't have steady forms of electricity or, an el or a literacy rate above 15% or they have a brand new road. And not only that, is all the workers building these projects are imported from China. So it's not even making jobs in the, in the host country that is the recipient of this. China's paying for this. They're providing the labor. They're providing a lot of times the earth-moving equipment that doesn't exist in these countries. How can they justify just, uh, investing in that and then claim poverty that they can't in, um, invest in global health, and they are starting to do a little bit more, but the main projects that have been ex very, very um, expensive have seemed not to have been health-related, and also not investing in their own people and saying that they need the money from um, all different type of multilateral organizations when they're spending large sums of money abroad on non-health-related projects. Cantor. Well, there's some fundamental difference between the uh, our way, I mean the American or developed countries' way of uh, foreign aid in Africa and Chinese way of foreign aid. We know that the Chinese, the, the foreign aid, uh, well, this, the government does not give the details about its aid programs in Africa. Uh, but uh, um, we know that uh, um, 
half of that was categorized as so-called free aid. Uh, the, uh, the no um, political strings attached. Uh, they um, tend to be bilateral. Uh, they also, but the different from the, the, the programs and other uh, implemented by other countries, these programs tend to be fast, efficient, uh, the, uh, and, and in a way also effective. You know, I actually might have to disagree with you that uh, you said China has not contributed significantly to uh, significant health aid to Africa. That is not true. And actually, uh, China, for example, continued to, to pursue health diplomacy in Africa as the uh, um, cost-effective foreign policy, a uh, foreign aid instrument. Um, the um, uh, by the end of 2009, for example, China has sent a total of 17,000 medical personnel to 47 African countries and regions and uh, served uh, some 20, 240 million people. And more recently, also, China has uh, uh, pledged to build 30 hospitals and provide the U.S. equivalent 37.5 million U.S. dollars in grants to supply those anti-malaria drugs and develop 30 um, anti-malaria, the malaria uh, prevention treatment centers in Africa. So indeed, it is doing a lot there. But uh, the, the problem is, is the lack of cooperation. Uh, well, firstly, there's a difference, fundamental difference in terms of the approaches. Uh, and secondly, there is a lack of cooperation between China and the United States and other countries uh, in um, providing health aid in Africa. And this, I believe this is the area that uh, we could uh, uh, encourage and uh, promote. Uh, the multilateral. Multilateral. Trilateral, yeah. as, uh, as I believe Jack said earlier. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's take a question here. Bristol, I'm a freelance journalist. Um, given the threats to the U.S. foreign aid budget and the cultural differences between China and the U.S., does the U.S. really want China competing with it more heavily in this area on the world stage? <laughs> Jack? Jack? <laughs> I wouldn't frame it as competition because I think this is a mission of humanitarian importance. As uh, when, you, uh, when I was asked, should we wait? When you do the math of six million people dying from AIDS, TB, and malaria, it implies that every day 20, 000, about 20,000 people are dying from just those three diseases alone. So to help rebuild health systems in these countries, I don't think it's really competition. I think America would welcome an additional contributor based on both absolute and comparative advantages. The United States has a very strong pharmaceutical biotech industry. We have, we have high rates of high, high uh, numbers of well-trained uh, individuals. China ha has pioneered uh, much in the realm of primary care. Um, they helped uh, develop the artemisinin, the raw ingredient that, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, the basis for the, the ACT medicine, which is absolutely transforming malaria treatment. So I, I would uh, articulate, reframe it as America would welcome. I, I don't speak for the administration, but I, I sense that uh, the American people will welcome uh, a contributory China working in concert with our experts. We have a question here, and then we'll come to the rear. Um, my name is Yixue, uh, and I'm actually a sophomore in George Washington University, and my major is international affairs, concentrating on global health. Um, and actually, my question will, uh, will come from a student uh, perspective. My first question is, is there any possibility that encourage China to take a mid path, which means not in, not, uh, in, not, not, uh, emerge China to become a donor quickly, but encourage China first become a self-sustained country in the health issue. And also, my second question will be, do you think is there any um, other things make China is not ready to become a donor instead of not willing to become donor? All right, so let's take the first question, which to paraphrase would be, let, what if China just said, okay, we're going to stop taking global fund money. We're not ready to be a, a much greater donor than we are now. Give us a few years, and here's a plan for us to become 
a, a, a more a pronounced donor in the future once we've dealt with some of our domestic issues. Jack, could you live with that? I think China has the financial wherewithal to address its domestic health uh, uh, needs and still supply, uh, w whether it's financial or technical or health workforce, uh, contribute to the alliance of countries that are operating in these regions. We, uh, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> it was mentioned that uh, uh, in, in some countries they're, they're actually building construction projects. Well, why couldn't, instead of building sports stadiums and, and art centers, they could be building clinics and, 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 and hospitals. It seems to me that there is a, a challenge of policy architecture and, 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 and basic vision that if judiciously applied can liberate resources domestically as well as have uh, a contribution internationally. China has just now, is, is now the third, has the third largest voting power in the IMF. They actively sought this. They want to contribute to the international stage. So if you go to the next level, say operationalize that, work in these countries, build the hospitals, build the clinics, build the road connectors, that can be done. So it's. Just as the no middle ground, no middle ground here. Time to really convert yourself into an international donor, uh, not just a net. This donor. country, the United States, after 9/11, through the recession, still accelerates its commitment. The Global Health Initiative authorized at 60 billion dollars. We have done it. We have actually gone deeper into debt to help other countries. So here's a. a not yet. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, other other other. Uh, countries in the international community that are in a relatively stronger financial position that hesitates to do modest amounts in this endeavor. All right, and uh, we had a question back in the rear. Mike Engelgal from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and working in global health, uh, focusing on non-communicable diseases, which is a huge issue now for uh, China. Uh, my question is a, a little more broad than that, though. I'm trying to get my head around the politics here. You have a country, um, an economic power, recent state visit here to the U.S. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, they're a recipient nation for these kinds of programs. How does the internal politics, what is the political space that can allow for what seems to be discordant, you know, where you're, you have this image of a power uh, economic giant, yet at the same time our recipient of, of, of global aid. And then related to that, how much of that is due, and I think Jack alluded to this, that the ministries of health uh, and the leadership for health in the country uh, may not have the influence they would need uh, to have more in the uh, health arena to, to move forward on some of these issues. Andrew, <coughs> without giving us a what appropriately would be a five or six day disquisition on Chinese politics, could you address the, the first part of that question in particular? What, in terms what, well, what creates this rather anomalous mm -hmm. situation yeah. uh, where uh, there are these enormous resources, there has been a mm -hmm. lack of investment internally, uh, and there is this uh, Strange uh, uh, external policy of becoming a, being a donor, but also being a taker of aid. How how how, how does all that work? Okay. Well, we have to keep in mind if you look at the history, right? Uh, uh, the China that um, uh, for a long time was not a major recipient of foreign aid. In fact, for a long time, uh, except for the, the Soviet aid, the refused to accept foreign aid during the Tangshan earthquake in 1976, for example. All the international organizations in foreign countries play, uh, promised uh, aid and uh, medical supplies to China. China said, no, we don't need your uh, money. We don't need your uh, equipment. We don't need any of that. We can do it all by ourselves. And actually, China, that did not change until 1979, to be uh, accurate, until 1987. Right? So uh, in the 1980s, it began to receive aid from developed countries, right, including 
ODA from Japan and international organizations such as WHO, World Bank, UNESCO, they all provide a letter, Global Fund, they all provide a health aid to China. But China's acceptance, basically, of foreign aid was not routinized until late 1980s. Uh, so that was the, basically the history, right, that the China's history of receiving massive foreign aid did not occur until late 1980s, actually 1987. So it's just, uh, we talk about 23 years of China receiving foreign aid. And uh, while well, in the meantime, as I said, it is already an active uh, uh, donor uh, the, in terms of global health, especially when we talk about its health aid to Africa, you know. So this is the transitional stage, and we should be a little bit more patient, allow actually the China uh, eventually to uh, f- uh, complete that transition from a recipient to uh, um, donor uh, nation. Jack? Did you I think Mike's question is, is quite profound, which is basically the question, how can health ministries be effective players in political ecologies? And I alluded that In my time of service at WHO, bolstering health ministries was a core part of my mission. I believe we have to train. Now, those who become health ministers, doctors, uh, being being in medicine and public health is a technically demanding uh, profession. And as you rise up through the ranks, you're very specialized. But you may not have the skill set to bargain with uh, with, uh, 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 versions of OMB. So I believe that one agenda in the future is how can we train uh, uh, promising health ministry officials to be uh, better bargainers, uh, being able to crystallize strategic goals, and being able to be persuasive and attract the uh, requisite funding. We, uh, we are getting close to the end of our time, so let's just take, if we could, just one more question, and then we'll go to final statements. Um, I'm Jean McDermott from the Fogarty International Center at NIH, and we run research training programs. So I want to just follow up with Jack's last comment and say, and ask him if he would see that um, supporting training for those kinds of people, is that a legitimate legitimate, uh, um, product for, for China to be a recipient rather than a donor? Absolutely, and in the spirit of full disclosure, I used to work at Fogarty. So this uh, uh, advancing biomedic- bilateral biomedical uh, research ties is, uh, is a, a, a very important function in bolstering, being able to train scientists how to use uh, the scientific method, how to set up laboratories, how to collect data and articulate it and, and hook it to a public health mission is a valuable and noteworthy uh, in, uh, work stream. All right. Well, we're now going to move to closing statements from uh, both of you. And you both did such a marvelous job of laying out your initial statements that I would ask you not necessarily to repeat those verbatim now. Uh, perhaps you want to give a very distilled version of that. But let's close by acknowledging what that the other person said you could go along with what could, and what specifically could be a way forward at this particular juncture, uh, given uh, the, the state of the U- uh, U.S. finances, uh, uh, the state of the global threats that we face in terms of uh, international health, and the desire to move forward in a constructive way uh, with the Chinese relationship. So since uh, Jack started, Andrew, I'm going to turn it over to you for your closing statement first. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Jack. I actually, as I, again, I agree with Jack on many fronts, and we all, I think, we uh, uh, we have no problems <laughs> that uh, China should uh, uh, chip in more in global health, and um, uh, the United States could play a constructive role in that process. And uh, uh, we also agree that China should uh, uh, invest more in its domestic uh, uh, health uh, system uh, that. Uh, uh, the uh, um, and uh, a, a trilateral, a multilateral approach would uh, be uh, the ideal approach in terms of cooperating with, uh, cooperating with China uh, in that uh, uh, toward that direction. So the question is how to achieve that transition. I'm uh, uh, basically I'm uh, instead of arguing for a uh, 
quick haste approach. I'm, uh, uh, basically, my argument is we should uh, be a little bit more patient, giving China more time, and in fact, uh, I also focus on the importance of focusing on encouraging more invested, uh, investment in domestic health spending. Because if, according to, as Jack has suggested, the reason for China's active pursuit of health aid is political, that is, uh, the Ministry of Health has very weak bureaucratic status, then why not encourage China to invest more in domestic health sector so that the Ministry of Health has reduced incentives to pursue foreign money? Uh, uh, so um, that is one. Uh, secondly, um, I would uh, ask the United States to chip in more, uh, and uh, especially to fulfill its pledge to develop a development aid to 0.7% of the gross national income, because so far we only reached 0.21%. You know, and nearly 20% of that goes to the building of uh, era, uh, the post-conflict rebuilding of Iraq and Afghanistan. So by raising the US ODA uh, with 67 billion to reach 0.7%, uh, there would be plenty of money available for achieving global development objectives. And thirdly, I think uh, we should encourage and promote the dialogues with China on international development issues and projects, including discussing policy, a potential collaboration, uh, encourage more transparency. Um, and for, uh, thirdly, I think uh, uh, in terms of this priorities of foreign aid to China, I think we should not just uh, focus on certain salient or sexy infectious disease like TB, uh, uh, like, I'm sorry, HIV uh, or malaria, but also focus on those infectious diseases such as uh, tuberculosis, uh, hepatitis B, and also focus more on non-chronic, I'm sorry, non-communicable uh, chronic diseases. You know, so uh, there um, should be a lot of potential uh, for the United States and China to collaborate on this, uh, in those areas. Okay. And the last word then goes to you. Well, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Yen Zhang. I, I, I'll build on the, the platform that you just laid out I, because I, I, I feel I can agree with much of it. Uh, instead of chipping in, I believe America and China should be shoveling more in, but that's a matter <laughs> of... Uh, semantics. The global health diplomacy is enlightened statecraft that catalyzes mutual pursuit that a healthier world is a safer world. And that, as I described earlier, uh, the global health diplomacy movement ha has many chapters to go. So I, I, I would like to see the next chapters of global health diplomacy on China to be filled with great stories rather than a series of blank pages, is which, which seems to be the trajectory that we're on. And to use this metaphor even further, the global health journey is not even at the fork in the road. We're on the wrong road. We're on a road where China depletes funds from the international community. It's creating divisions and questions from the Congress and from civil society and the NGOs about the equity in this pathway. And what I'm suggesting that US-China working together collaboratively in a friendly way creates that, uh, that connector across the median strip to connect with the other road. And I envision that road is the multi-lane, multilateral superhighway with a supply chain that is brimming with uh, public health goods that are going deep into impoverished nations. And China has the ability to join this convoy, dedicating its workforce, its finances, its expertise, and the heart of the Chinese people. I'm of Chinese heritage. I know, probably know this. And together, if we can build this convoy and look at the horizon of aspirations, our most, most noble, ambitious goals, and we can say, we can say that we can achieve a, a, a fulfillment of a campaign of liberation by defeating AIDS, defeating TB, defeating malaria. We free millions of people. We save 20,000 people a day from death, disease, and debilitation. And we, pref we, we, we achieve a, a very tangible outcome, which is parents alive for their children, children alive 
for their futures and entire nations alive for their destiny. And that is, that is why I feel so passionately about this. And thank you very much. Well, we seem to have converged on a series of road and construction metaphors uh, to articulate uh, the differences, as well as the areas of uh, agreement among our two, uh, between our two panelists. Uh, Andrew's basic position being, yes, China should be chipping in more money on global health. Uh, Jack saying, no, it ought to be shoveling in more money on global health. Uh, Andrew feeling that uh, China is on the right road. Uh, it's just going to progress slowly toward the destination, but it is on the right road. And Jack feeling, no, it's on the wrong road uh, at this point and needs to get on the right road. And then finally, we have our automotive analogy uh, or, or uh, uh, transportation <laughs> modality analogy, which says that, uh, in effect, Jack believes China has to get in, on board now a major international global convoy to combat these diseases in very poor countries. And I guess that would leave you, Andrew, arguing that China needs to develop its own unique little car at the moment and chug along and get there, uh, 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 get there, pursue the same path, pursue the same road, but get there perhaps in a slightly, at a slightly different timetable than Jack would like to see. So with that, we have our fault lines clearly established. It is unfortunate that the we're using the phrase fault lines today on a day when there has been a terrible earthquake uh, in other parts of the world. And so once again, we emphasize our solidarity with the Japanese people and with others who may be threatened by the aftershocks as well as the tsunami. Uh, but we thank all of you for coming today and look forward to engaging you in the next of the uh, debates over the fault lines in global health. So thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Really, really, very well done, both of you. Thank you.